Heaven, as we bow before you this day, we glorify you, we honor you, we praise your name. You are the sovereign God of the universe. You are the bestower of every good and perfect gift. We lift you up. Your name is holy. We adore you and thank you. Father, we ask that you would bless us in this hour as we worship you, as we sing our songs of praise. Fill us with your goodness, your love, and your care. Inspire us and challenge us. As we look at your word, speak to each heart through the words of the scriptures. They've been so inspired. May the Holy Spirit that inspired the scriptures inspire us to do better in our daily lives. May we honor and glorify you. In this hour, we ask that you would make us open vessels to receive your word. Thank you for what you're going to give each one that is here in a message, in a lesson that's tailor-made for each one of us. We praise you for what you are about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I appreciated the thoughts that uh, Jim had to share. God wants to be a part of your life. A good passage to read, a good book to read regarding life itself is the book of Ecclesiastes. Because in a lot of areas, the writer of Ecclesiastes says a lot of things are vanity. But God wants to be a part of our life he wants us to enjoy life, just not to leave him out of it. I also experienced similar things that uh, what he spoke about in the opportunities of witnessing, in serving, and having uh, and sharing God's word. Had a, had an opportunity this week. A gentleman came and asked me a question. The store wasn't real busy. So I looked around and shut my light off so nobody would come, and we talked. And uh, yeah, we didn't agree. But I was, I shared with him the things that I believed, and I let him know that I understood where his position was, and simply asked, that as he pondered things we said, that he would respect me for what I understood. And though we might not totally agree, we could agree to disagree as friends and not reject. Because I said so many times today, when somebody doesn't agree with you, they just flat out don't like you. And you find that in a lot of areas of life in discussion. They either got to agree with you or they're not your friend at all. And I think studying the scriptures is one of those areas where you need to be open because I thought afterwards, did this man not agree with me because saw that what I said was wrong? Or did he not agree with me because he had never heard that point of view expressed before. That's something different. Because at first thought, everything we've been taught might be uh, put up to question. Besides, the world is flat, isn't it? No, but that changed.
People are going through surgeries. People are having diseases, illnesses. And I thought about a diseased soul. So I've entitled it as such. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, is where our scripture reading comes from. Jeremiah, chapter 8, three verses, 20, 21, and 22. The word of the Lord says this, Harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the brokenness of my, the daughter of my people, I am broken. I mourn. Dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter of my people been restored? Ancient medicine, people had cures. Sometimes people thought they, they would get into a, the pool of Siloam or the pool of Bethsaida, and, and um, if, if the water got stirred by uh, some unique uh, circumstance, the first one in was supposedly going to be able to be healed. Um, there was, in that day, medicine that might help cures. And some of it came out of Egypt. Some of it came out of Gilead. The balm of Gilead. A balm is kind of a, is a, a, a term used for a fragrant ointment that's sometimes used to heal or smooth the skin. An ointment or a balm. The balm of Gilead was a rare perfume that believed to come from the Styrax tree for which Gilead was famous. It was found there. It grew there. That's where it came from. The balm of Gilead. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 25, this is a story where Joseph has, uh, uh, Jacob, Joseph has been uh, betrayed by his brothers. They've thrown him into a pit. They sat down to eat a meal and they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing ar aromic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. This would have been part of what they were carrying when they came through, ultimately bought Joseph and took him to Egypt. The balm of Gilead. You know a lot of people that are sick. There are people going through surgeries. Uh, Cancer is rampant. We hear more and more people that we know that are afflicted with cancer. It's a terrible disease. We sometimes just, for fear of the word, we call it the C word. My, um, my dad was sick back in uh, 1995. He was in the hospital. And my brother, my oldest brother, told him that he had a tumor. And he didn't say the C word. The doctor says you've got a tumor. And he told the brothers, don't use the C word around him. A pastor came in and visited with him and said, Mr. Swartz, what seems to be the problem? He said, I've got cancer, but my boys don't know it. It was the elephant in the room. He knew it, and we knew it, but we didn't, want, we didn't think he knew, and we didn't want him to know, and he knew all along. He had cancer, from which he died of. Sometimes there's 
medicines that can be used to help with that. But there's another type of disease for which we're all afflicted. We are sin sick. We are sin sick. We've been sickened by sin and it has corrupted and damaged us as individuals so that we are spiritually sick. We are aliens from God. We are strangers from the covenant of promise. We are without hope and without God in the world. That is a picture of the Gentiles, as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, chapter 2. But there is a remedy for that sin, and that is Jesus Christ. In some ways, we not, may not be physically sick, but because sin causes us to be spiritually sick, the things that make us spiritually sick are wide and vast. There's a lot of them. We've created or developed other gods. We've put things ahead of God. They become, those things become our God because it has become a priority in our life. Some of the things that uh, are illustrated as our gods, it could be our work, it could be our money, it could be the stuff money buys, it could be sports, it could be high school extra extracurricular. When things pull us away from God or worshiping, from worshiping God, then that item becomes our God when it takes priority over the creator of the universe. Sickness in Christianity might be hypocrisy, backsliding, complacency, apathy. Even some deny the existence of God. Often they deny, they may not deny that God exists, but they also deny the sovereignty of God, the fact that God is absolute, which he is. An interesting thing, many people today don't believe in absolutes, but to say that there is no absolutes is itself an absolute. And when we acknowledge that God exists, all of a sudden we acknowledge the fact that there is someone greater than, than we are, and that we might then be answerable to him. So if we don't want to be answerable to him, we'll deny. Well, there are three spiritually rhetorical questions in our text here. We find them in verse 22. A rhetorical question is a question that is asked in order to make a point, not necessarily to get an answer. Or questions may be asked and the answers are readily known. In today's society, somebody asks that type of a rhetorical question, and the response they get is, duh. I mean, it goes without saying. Um, is it light outside? Duh. Hey, look. Sure it is. A person who lives in their own community all their life and really doesn't go many places, then they're found to be hungry and need of food, and somebody said, well, isn't there a grocery store in your town? Sure there is. They're not feeling well. Isn't there a doctor around in this town? Sure there is. You need money. I'm sure money. Well, you've got a bank account. Why isn't there a bank in your town? Questions that seem to go unanswered. It's, it's a rhetorical question. You know that they're there.
These three rhetorical questions, the first from the, is, is there no balm in Gilead? That's a rhetorical question when you study this because Gilead was the source of where the balm came from. Of course there's balm in Gilead. Duh. Is there no physician? God is speaking. God's the great physician. Sure, there's a physician. If you would turn to me, you could be healed. So then another rhetorical question, why then has not the health of my daughter, the health of the daughter of my people been restored? They don't want to be. They don't want to be. They refuse to worship God. They refuse to obey God. They've made a decision. They've made a choice. They're spiritually sick because that's the way they want to be. Is there no uh, bomb in Gilead? Kind of a stupid question, huh? That's where you find it. It's like, are there any express aisles at Walmart? Uh, yeah. The doctor is in his office, and the doctor is readily available. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 to 20, we find that God lays out a plan, a remedy for spiritual sickness. Come now, let's reason together. Let's talk this over. Let's discuss this. Let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Truly the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now you see what's, what this is saying? Let's reason together. Let's look at both sides. Let's look at this. If your sins are a scarlet, do you like it that way or do you want it changed? Because there is a remedy. They can be white as snow. Although though they're red as crimson, they will be as wool. If... If you would consent to obey, here's, here's what you're going to get. But if you don't want to, yeah, okay, it's your choice. If you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. All right, here it is. Which do you want, A or B? It's not hidden by a curtain or a veil. God has laid it out. Which do you want? Let's... It's plain. Why hasn't the health of my daughter been restored? From God's perspective, because of his holiness, he has to withdraw. Because they have chosen. And he's separated because of their unfaithfulness. The people have spoken. The people have made a decision. I've sent my prophets and you've ignored them. I've given you warning, but you don't listen. Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, through the Old Testament, through what the people already knew, through the Hebrew scriptures, they'd seen what the prophets had said. They'd seen what the early fathers of the faith had said in these last days he's spoken to us in his son whom he's appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world it is his son that has spoken in these last days to show us what God wants us to do to lead us back to the father to lead us back to the faith as what God originally wants 
He's used different people to point the way, to guide, to show, to lead, and direct his people, Israel. And now the Gentiles to be able to have peace with God. Yes, there is a balm for your spiritual healing, and God has provided the medicine for that spiritual healing. His name is Jesus. There is an answer to our problem of sin. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now look, notice, when we walk in the light, and he's talking to, he's writing uh, to Christian people, that if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, and then we have fellowship with one another. We're like-minded. Because we're drawn together, we're, we're bonded together by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a common bond that we have. Because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. But you know, there are some people that are ignorant of the disease. Some people think the scriptures are not important anymore, or they're not relevant anymore, and they choose to do what they think is right. It's no different than it was years ago. Back in the day of the judges, when there was no prophet, no king, in Judges 17 and 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And today, because we have the ability to, a free will to choose Jesus Christ or reject, we are at the helm, so to speak. We get to choose. We get to choose, do we obey God or do we disobey? And I say, I can do whatever I want. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. We are living like it was in the days of the judges, when there was no king in Israel, everyone seems to do as they, uh, what seems to be right in their own eyes. Some people like to be sick. Some people don't want to take the medicine. In Matthew chapter 19, this is the last scripture we're going to have, Matthew 19, starting with verse 16, this is the rich young ruler. In Matthew, in Matthew 19, and starting with verse 16, we find the, the rich young ruler asks a question, a very pointed question. Teacher, what good thing do I do that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus answered, he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one, one who is good. Of course, he's directing them to God, of course. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said, which ones? Jesus gives him a direct answer. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these, all these things I have kept, I'm already doing that. Something is not right in my life. I'm already doing that. But there just seems to be something missing. So now, the teacher is going to give him the answer to the test. It's even better than open book test. He's giving him the answer. What am I lacking? Jesus said, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, now I'm going to paraphrase here. When the young man heard this statement, when the young man heard what the prescription was for his disease, he didn't want to take the medicine. When the young man heard the statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. He didn't like what the diagnosis was going to entail. He didn't like what, he didn't want to do the therapy. He didn't want to do the rehab. He didn't want to give up what he had that was so important to him. He asked the question, I've done all this, what am I lacking? And Jesus said, here's the area that you need to clean up. Go and sell everything. Because it was what was most important to his life. He said, you sell this. Then come and follow me. Because that's the answer. That'll give you peace. That'll give you happiness. That will make you fulfilled. That will make you complete. But when the young man heard it, because of all that he had, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. It's interesting to note the next verse, which I didn't give Dave, simply says Jesus spoke to his disciples following this, and he said, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice what this, notice what does not take place. Some things we read and we learn things from what it says, but we also learn some things from what it does not say. Jesus did not run after the guy and say, wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. We can negotiate. How about half now and the other half over a period of years? Jesus didn't barter with the price. He said, here it is. Here's the remedy. Here's the medication. But like some people, they start taking the medicine. They think that they're better and they stop taking the medication and they get sick again. Because I, well, yeah, I'll get rid of my stuff. And I start getting rid of my stuff. But, ah, that one's, I'll save that. And I'll save that. And pretty soon, I save more and more and get rid of less and less. Because I, I'm doing what I want. I've heard what the prescription is. Back to Jim's illustration. It was interesting back when I have heard remedies and prescriptions. If the doctor said to me, for your health, it'd be better not to eat Brussels sprouts, I said, okay. I'd limit your coffee. Can we talk about this? Hey. Okay. I like, you know, if, if it's no problem, yeah, forget the broccoli, forget the Brussels sprouts. But what I like, let's discuss this. Can we come to a good agreement? What the, what's the medicine that the great physician is giving? We need to follow him. He needs to be number one. We have the spiritual ill, we have the spiritual illness. We are spiritually sick. The cure is Jesus Christ and following him, taking up your cross daily. We know the physician. We know what the disease. We've heard it. Most of you have accepted the, career, the, the cure for the disease. And now, did you know it's fun to tell other people about the cure? 
It's fun to let them know what the cure is, and all of a sudden, watch the eyes light up. That's what Jesus wants us to do, to go and share where you are. You know, it's not putting on a, not putting on your special evangelistic suit. Not a special set of clothes that you got to wear in order to talk about the name of Jesus Christ. It's over the back fence. Hey, and jump in with both feet. It's fun. But we have a spiritual disease. There is a cure for the spiritual disease. God has provided it, and it's Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. Our closing song is song number 124. The song is There's Room at the Cross for You. I